Good morning. My name is Marty Mills. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this service of First Presbyterian Church, Salina. We're glad for you all joining in this service electronically. Whether you are listening to the radio broadcast on KINA 910 AM or 107.5 FM, or watching our online video stream via Facebook or YouTube. If you would like a copy of the bulletin to follow along, you may find it either on the church's Facebook page or at our website, fpcsalina.org. Let us pray. God of majesty, you led the Messiah through suffering into the risen life and took him up to the glory of heaven. Clothe us with the power promised from on high and send us forth to the ends of the earth as heralds of repentance and witnesses of Jesus Christ, firstborn of the dead, who lives with you now and always in the unity of the Holy Spirit. God forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn, O God as We Pause, is a Welsh folk melody, better known to us in the hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. The words of the hymn, O God, as we pause, were written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette and may be found in your bulletin or, if you are watching online, on your screen. ourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all our anxiety on the Lord who cares for us. Trusting in God's grace, hear this prayer of confession. Let us pray. You call us to be your witnesses to the end of the earth and clothe us with power from on high. Yet we stand still, our eyes fixed on the heavens as though Jesus will reappear in the clouds to point the way. We cling to the past, for we find comfort in familiar traditions, 
even if they no longer serve your purposes. We fear the future, for we cannot imagine a new season of ministry, even though you promise to empower us. Refocus us, O Lord, and fill us with expectant hope as we step into the future you will bring. Baptize us again with your Spirit and enlighten our hearts to discern your will so that we might embody the fullness of Christ at work in the world. Hear the good news of God, of God's promise. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia, and thanks be to God. at home worshiping on this beautiful Sunday just like the rest of you and during this time although I so miss seeing many of you in worship on Sundays I also have been thinking a lot about how awesome it is that we can worship anywhere anytime even when we're stuck at home during this pandemic so that got me thinking what is the best way of worshiping well, one way that I think is a pretty great way that God really appreciates is through prayer. So on the count of three, I want you to shout within your household the time in which you pray the most, okay? So ready? I'm going to count to three and then I want you to shout to whoever is with you or to yourself when you pray. So that could be, for example, um, in the morning when you wake up at lunchtime, at dinner time, before you go to bed, multiple times throughout the day. Whenever you pray, I want you to shout it, okay? So ready? Let's go. One, two, three. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, let me tell you, I probably pray the most um, at night. I try to pray every day, like during the day when I think of things that come my way that maybe could use a prayer. But the time that I try to dedicate the most to praying is at bedtime when I am laying down to go to sleep at night. So I think it's important that we all remember the importance of prayer and the importance of taking time to talk to God through prayer because he wants to hear our prayers and he wants to just have a conversation with us. And honestly, I find, and I'm sure you'll find too, that the more we pray, the closer we feel to God. So today, what I challenge you to do is think about ways that you can pray. And what's cool is that there's so many ways. So one of the ways, of course, that you can pray is just to get down on your hands and knees, fold your hands, and just pray the good old traditional way. But you know what? You don't even have to do that. You don't even have to close your eyes to pray like many people think you do. You can think a thought and just say, hey, God, you know, I'm praying for a beautiful day for all of our children and for all of our families. Or you could draw a picture or you could write a poem or you could just write something on a piece of paper. 
There are so many ways to pray. So my challenge to you today is to share a prayer that maybe you might have and to write it down or to draw it. And if you feel comfortable, we would love to have you send us pictures or share them on the Facebook comments here if you're watching via Facebook or send it to us via email or any other form that you have of communicating with us. And we would love to post those on social media if you give permission to do so, as we want to hear your prayers and we want to share our prayers with you. So thank you guys, and I hope you'll spend this day and every day in prayer and also knowing that we here at FPC are praying for you. So let us bow our heads and say a prayer together. Dear God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to pray to you. We know that you hear our prayers and that you are always listening. We pray that we always remember to pray. And we thank you, God, for all that you give us. And all God's children said, amen. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. God most high, reigning in glory, send down your spirit of wisdom to shine in your heavenly word so that we may worship you with joy, continually blessing your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood before them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip's Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I've made, no, made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and that you have believed, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And please join me in prayer. God be in my head and in my understanding. God be in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing. Amen. The book of Acts is the story of the early church, part two of the story, if you will. It's the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. After Jesus was raised from the dead, Luke tells us he appeared to his disciples and gave them some final instructions. Part two takes, begins where Luke left off, with the ascension of Jesus into heaven and the disciples waiting for the coming of the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. After the ascension, men in white robes asked a pointed question, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Then they returned to Jerusalem in the upper room. Luke, the newsman's gospel writer and friend, chronicles by name the men who were there. Then, almost as an afterthought, it's noted that also present were 
certain women. Certain women? Really? What a nice, convenient, and loaded phrase that is. Certain women freighted with the weight of a patriarchal society then and now. Certain women not deserving to be named, perhaps. Maybe you don't see this as a big deal, but that, my friends, only illustrates the problem, doesn't it? At a meeting recently, a male speaker referred to the female moderator as honey. No big deal. Remember, words matter. A video produced by the United Methodist Church cited unhealthy and inappropriate comments made by male church members and male colleagues to the ministry to female pastors in North Carolina. Among the comments were, I can't concentrate on your sermon because you're so pretty. This is our little girl preacher. You're looking fat today. If God can use a donkey, then I guess he can use women in ministry. If I were 20 years younger, you wouldn't be able to keep me away from you. Really? Though the Presbyterian Church and other denominations support the ordination of women, it's still relatively rare for women to crack what some have called the stained glass ceiling to hold top leadership positions within their denominations. This church... FBC Salina can be proud that it was the largest Presbyterian church in the country to have a woman as its lead pastor and head of staff in the 1980s when it called Cynthia Campbell. Still, there are subtle ways that sexism shows up in congregational settings through offensive observations about a clergywoman's appearance or pointed jabs about her ability to serve as pastor. The male head of a staff at a church insisted on referring to the female associate as one of the pastors, an equal colleague in ministry rather than as an associate. Despite his attempts not to be sexist or ageist, he still tripped himself up by settling on this description for her. I'm the serious one, because the associate's default mode was never to take herself too seriously. That description, too, unfortunately, backfired. I need you to stop telling everyone that you're you're the serious one, because what they're hearing is that I don't take worship seriously, she told him. I take worship incredibly seriously. While I appreciate what you're doing, we need new descriptors. Tell them I'm bubbly and you're somber. Tell them I'm fun and you're morose, whatever, but we need to... to agree on new language. The irony of all of this is that Luke actually got it. His use of certain women may well have been included as a way to make us uncomfortable and to pay more attention. This idea of persistent, independent, disobedient, non-submissive women, if after all, is a dominant theme in Luke and Acts. Luke was written primarily to Gentiles, to non-Jews. It's a gospel that wants its readers to understand that God offers life and love, hope and salvation to Jews and Gentiles alike. It was written to include those who were left out, not just Gentiles, but everyone else at the fringes of society, women, children, poor, the broken, and the stranger. It starts all the way back in the first chapter of Luke with the Magnificat, Mary's prayer to God, celebrating that the hungry will be filled and the poor will not go wanting and the weak will be made strong. There are stories throughout the gospel, not of certain women unnamed and unimportant, but of women of whom it might be said, nevertheless, they persisted, to coin another politically fraught and powerfully inspiring phrase. Think of the persistent widow appearing before the unjust judge in Jesus' parable in Luke. Presbyterian pastor Alexandra Rogers says, We all know this woman. We've seen her before. We've seen her on the news behind a bank of microphones seeking justice for the death of her child. We've seen her in the crowd with a protest sign seeking action from a legislative body that will not budge. 
We've seen her at the community meeting and the school board. We've seen her on her knees in the church or prostrate on the floor. We've heard her voice as she won't take no for an answer. We've heard the volume rise and the tone get more desperate or maybe just more determined. And our reaction to her vary. Some of us want her to shut her mouth and just go away. Others marvel at her courage and determination. Some wish she might use a different tactic, and others wish she'd keep her problems to herself. Some join in the crowd or on the floor at the meeting. Others just hope she'll stop making such a fuss. Certain women, indeed. Nevertheless, they persisted. Certain women, those women who walked with Christ as his followers and disciples, Certain women, named and unnamed, who exercised faith in Christ, learned and lived his teachings, and testified at his ministry, miracles, and majesty. These certain women became exemplary disciples, important witnesses in the work of salvation. These certain women are still with us today, aren't they? Nevertheless, still persisting. Think of those who fit that description here within our ranks today. Think of those through the years who've helped shape each of us in our lives of faith, whether they be family members, friends, teachers, or colleagues. It's a particularly appropriate subject even now, two weeks after Mother's Day and on Memorial Day weekend, because this church, First Presbyterian, like most others in our denomination, is majority female, 57% to 43%. So, What are the hallmarks of these certain women of which it might be said, nevertheless, she persisted? Faithful discipleship, convinced, positive, confident, firm, definite, assured, and dependable. Certain women is more about individual qualities rather than a group of women separate from the others. Rather than this being about a certain group of women then, It's identified in women who are themselves certain, certain about certain things. So who were these certain women? We believe they were well-to-do followers of Jesus, some of high position. They were generous. They were loyal. They gathered on the hillside and then in the upper room, real human beings with names, identities, histories, and hopes. They were the ones who discovered the empty tomb. They announced the resurrection to the other disciples. They followed Jesus as far as they could, and then they waited for the coming of the Spirit. It's they who made up the first church. Though the, t- through the, though the times have changed radically, it's still real human beings, men and women, certain women with names, with identities, with histories and hopes, who gather to wait again, even today, for the coming of the Spirit. It is we who make up today's church as we gather to pray for the coming of that Spirit in our own lives and in the life of our congregation. Even now, we wait for that Pentecostal power. They and we pray for understanding, pray for wisdom, for guidance, for strength to go on, They and we pray in hope and fear, in faith and doubt, in obedience and wonder. We ask ourselves, as they surely must have, what lies ahead for us, working to usher in the realm and reign of God which will come riding on our shoulders through the work of our hands, following the journeys of our feet, all through the power of that Holy Spirit given to us on Pentecost, as promised by Jesus at his ascension. Just as we deal with certain women, we, uncertain, wrestle with certain questions, don't we? What is this realm of God? Is it just spiritual? Is it also social and political? What will it look like, feel like, sound like, even taste like? How will it work? Who will be in charge? What will be our roles in such a realm? And most importantly, When will it come? It'll be a kingdom founded on love, my friends, and not on power. It'll be characterized by love, compassion, and justice, not power and privilege, wealth, or might. As certain women know, 
and will tell us loudly. It will take a village, a community, to bring in this kingdom. It's not enough to do it alone. We have to meet, we have to travel, we have to work together in Christ's name, and most importantly, we need each other's witness and support, challenge and care in order to live into the possibilities and expectation of God's realm. We need certain women, don't we? Yes, on that hillside were certain women. They were indeed certain And they, like countless others through the years, persisted nevertheless. In closing, listen to this Speaking Truth to Power poem by fellow Presbyterian minister Leighton Williams, titled Persisterhood. I've been called persistent, like it should make me feel ashamed, like stubborn is a sin and pride an ugly name. I've been told that I'm a bleeding heart and my blood makes me unclean and that because I'm a woman, I should be silent and unseen. But I know what they're afraid of and I know that they are wrong because persistence, heart, and stubborn pride are all what make me strong. And they link me to a sisterhood who cries and fights and stands and refuses to be silenced by some frightened man's demands. So you can try to keep us quiet, and you can try to keep us down, but you will feel the force of womanness refusing to be bound. And you can try to conquer us with laws or might or fist, but you'll learn what we already know, that always we persist. Thank God this day for certain women. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Having heard the word proclaimed, let us affirm what it is that we do believe by using words from the Confession of 1967. New life in Christ takes shape in a community in which people know that God loves and accepts them in spite of what they are. They therefore accept themselves and love others, knowing that no one has any ground on which to stand except God's grace. Amen. I love to tell the story Jesus and his glory.
The following is a prayer. Time of pandemic. Lori Archer Rabel, co-pastor at Selwyn Avenue Presbyterian Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. This prayer is based on John 1, verse 1, and Romans 8, verses 18 through 28. Let us pray. Shut down, expose, flatten, peak, risk, isolate, intubate. O holy God, words matter. You have commanded the warm rays of morning sun and whispered a moonbeam across the night sky. We have been told the sufferings of these times are not worth comparing to the glory you are about to reveal. And yet, creation waits with eager longing. Tests, food, shelter, antibodies, jobs, access, touch, relief, thousands, millions. Creation waits to be liberated from its bondage to decay in order to obtain freedom of the children of God. We have been weary. We have grown inwardly while we wait for redemption. We have been groaning for what might be born. Zoom, masks, Clorox, vaccines, loans, hope. Hope? Yes the hope of our salvation, hope that is not seen. When it comes down to it, God, words matter. If we are really honest, we don't know how to pray as we ought. Not even a hundred, not even a gathered bunch of baptized church people. Not even the saints of your churches, especially not us. Fatigue, grief, plague, death. Oh, for your spirit to intercede as a sigh too deep for words. Search our hearts, O oh God. Intercede according to your will alone. Search our thick traditions, our biased assumptions, tainted agendas, and tired patterns that we might be called children of God. In the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our groaning, even in the midst of death, we know, we hope, and we pray all work together for good. Together we work for redemption, for a new thing being born. Words matter. In the beginning was the one word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Amen. And now we pray together using the words that Christ Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's hard to believe, but May ends one week from today, and with May's ending comes the end of Project Salina. Project Salina allows us to partner with other organizations and businesses in the city to fight hunger. To be safe in this time of social distancing, Project Salina is asking for monetary donations only in 2020. They will use these donations to purchase food to distribute to Ashby House, the Salina Emergency Aid Food Bank, the Salina Rescue Mission, DVAC, and the Salina Salvation Army. This is a wonderful way to help those in need in our city, and there are many more folks who are hungry now due to the effects of COVID-19. To encourage your donations, our church's Social Justice and Mission Committee is matching donations made through the church in the month of May. The committee is pledging up to $1,500 from its annual budget to amplify the impact Project Salina will have in this great time of need. To donate, you can visit our website, fpcsalina.org, and click on the Giving tab, or you can mail your donation to the church. Please make out the payment to First Presbyterian Church, 
with Project Salina clearly indicated on your payment and mail it to P.O. Box 585, Salina, Kansas, 67402. FPC Salina is joining other churches in the Presbyterian Church USA in our denomination's Pentecost offering. 40% of those funds we collect remain within our congregation to support ministries with children and youth in our church and local community. 25% goes to the young adult volunteer experience, something in which FPC is deeply involved with our own Teresa Cooper slated to serve as a young adult volunteer, or YAV, in Scotland. 25% of the Pentecost offering goes to youth and those who work with youth nationally, and 10% supports the Educate a Child, Transform the World initiative. The goal of this initiative is to motivate and inspire Presbyterians to better the lives of one million children. There are three ways in which you can contribute to the Pentecost offering through our own congregation by texting the word YOUNG to 56512 or by visiting pcusa.org slash Pentecost. We also invite you to support other ministries of First Presbyterian Church with donations or by remembering to keep current your stewardship pledges. There are four ways you can do this. You can mail your donation to P.O. Box 585, Salina, Kansas, 67402. Again, that's P.O. Box 585, Salina, Kansas, 67402. You can also give on our website, fpcsalina.org, on the Give tab. Again, that's fpcsalina.org on the Give tab. You can text your offering as well. Simply text the word GIVE or a dollar amount to 785-329-9830. Again, you can text the word GIVE or a dollar amount to 785-329-9830. Finally, you can also download the Church by Ministry One app and search for us there. Again, the app is called Church by Ministry One, where Ministry One is one word. There is only one Lord and a God from whom all things come and for whom we live. Let us offer our lives to the Lord.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our closing hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns. courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and that Holy Spirit. Amen.